Well, hi everyone. It's great to see you at Science Meets Music again. Uh, I'm David Fitzpatrick. I'm CEO and Scientific Director of the Max Planck Florida Institute for Neuroscience. And um, let's see, tonight we get to experience all the talents, dedication, energy, passion, and perseverance of two game changers. One who's changing how we think about the collective social behavior of animals, going all the way from ants to humans, and the other's changing how we think about musical performances. As uh, have you, those of you who've checked her out on the, on the web uh, know, her reviewers have said uh, that she's using the piano to provide a festival for all of the senses. So it's going to be fun. Now, um, it's, it's great to see you. It's, uh, may I thank once again the Benjamin School and its head, Bob Goldberg, for sharing this absolutely fantastic venue. Um, thanks also to Jimmy and Becky Mayer, uh, who have been supporting the musical part of this program now uh, for the last few years. And we're especially grateful to see all the loyal members of the Max Planck Florida Institute Brain Trust who are with us tonight. Let's hear a hand, a round of applause for the Brain Trust. Um, we thank them for their generous support of our research and our training endeavors. Um, this is actually uh, the second occasion this week uh, that I've had the opportunity to thank uh, the Brain Trust members for their support. Um, this past Tuesday, we invited our Brain Trust members to the Institute for a private reception at our Institute, where we showcased some of our outstanding young scientists. And we gave our Brain Trust members an opportunity to act to, uh, to interact one-on-one -on -one with these researchers, learning firsthand how their contributions are helping us achieve fundamental new insights into brain circuits that are essential for addressing a host of neurological and psychiatric disorders. Now, the Institute is, I hate to do this, it sounds like I'm bragging, but trust me, we're doing really well, okay? Uh, in terms of our research accomplishments, uh, the numbers of high impact papers, external grant support, recognition in the scientific community, and it was really wonderful to see our Brain Trust members getting to see the people who are at the bench and making this happen. They also heard two of our post-baccalaureate scholars, exceptional young women, explain how their experience working in our research labs has changed their lives and their joy at being accepted into medical school, one into a very select MD PhD program which covers all the expenses of the training that allows them to really pursue their passion. The post -bac program is only one way in which the Institute is contributing to the lives of young people. High school students, undergraduates, post -bac fellows, graduate students, giving them an opportunity to see if scientific research is the right direction for them and helping them find the right place to pursue their interests. So for those of you who are not yet Brain Trust members. Uh, I encourage you to uh, check out our website and our brochures to get a better understanding uh, of the full uh, extent of our impact, both in research and in training. Um, and we would love to include you in next year's reception so you can experience the Institute firsthand and have a very special treat, a fantastic musical performance. So. What's this series called? Science Meets Music, so SMM. Well, at the reception, you get to see another SMM. It's Scientist Makes Music, 
And as this year's attendees will tell you, it's a wonderful performance by my fellow scientific director, Dr. Ryoe Yasuda. So those of you who attended, please let us know how you liked your experience. Now, speaking of wonderful performances, um, you are really in for a treat tonight with our special musical guest, Sofia Yuravayeva. Um, Sofia was born in Siberia to a family of passionate music lovers. Uh, after moving with her family to Ukraine, she graduated from the Odessa Stolarsky Music School for highly talented children. Uh, she was then invited to Germany uh, for postgraduate study as a recipient of a full scholarship where she earned both a master's and doctoral degree in musical performance. And due to her superlative achievements in the field of music, in 2009, the US Department of State granted her permanent residency in the US, a rare privilege reserved for individuals of extraordinary ability, recognizing these honorees as the best of the best in their field of endeavor. Sophia had her American debut at the Steinway Gallery in Miami. That was filmed and broadcast nationwide on television. Um, and if you haven't checked her out, I, uh, I suggest, I encourage you to, uh, to check out her performances on YouTube. Uh, they are absolutely fantastic. So uh, Sophia's electrifying virtuosity um, and musicality brought her numerous prizes in international competitions. And not only have her concerts been described as a festival for all the senses, how about a magic ride on the witch's broom, okay? Um, and brilliant technique with soul. So tonight, Sophia will first be performing uh, Franz Liszt's Nocturne Number no. Three, Love Dream, and Etudes Number no. Six from the uh, Paganini Etudes. Um, and after the lecture, uh, Sophia will perform Camille Saison's The Swan uh, from the Carnival of the Animals and uh, Piano Concerto Number no. 2. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Sophia Yurovayeva. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you will hear two pieces by great Franz Liszt. While living in Paris, Liszt heard a concert by Niccolo Paganini. Paganini was the most famous violinist of the 19th century. He was such a phenomenal performer that people believed he was possessed by the devil. <laughs> Liszt was so mesmerized by Paganini's amazing ability that he decided to recreate that same level of wizardry on the piano. He wrote a set of etudes dedicated to Paganini. Besides being a piano virtuoso, Liszt was a big romantic. He was a handsome and dashing figure with lots of charisma. All women fainted from his music and his charm and threw themselves at his feet.
Um, Ian, uh, hard act to follow. I'm sorry, man. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody in this room at, at one time or another has, uh, has looked on the ground, has looked into the air, has looked into the water, um, and noticed that individuals of many species exhibit complex coordinated behaviors. So swarms of insects, flocks of birds, schools of fish. And, you know, we see it so often, we kind of take it for granted. Yeah, that's what fish do, that's what birds do, etc. But did you ever stop to think how this happens? How an individual animal contributes to this collective behavior? What are the rules that explain the behavior of the individual, the sensory cues, the motor responses that guide the individuals to produce this group behavior? And the evolutionary pressures that have resulted in this beautiful symphony of collective behavior. Well, tonight you're gonna to hear from the world's leading expert on collective animal behavior, Ian Cousin. In fact, he can correct me, but I never heard the word collective animal behavior until I read his papers, okay? Um, in his research, Ian combines detailed experimental studies in his laboratory in Germany with observational studies of animals in the wild, uh, made at field sites in Australia, Zambia, Kenya, South Africa, and Israel. And it really has allowed him to develop an understanding of collective animal behavior in ecologically relevant contexts. Um, Ian grew up in Scotland, uh, went to university in England, uh, did his uh, PhD at the University of Bath, um, uh, postdoc at University of Leeds. Um, he came to the US and started his independent research career as a professor at Princeton. And in 2014, he moved to Germany to become a Max Planck director at the Institute for Ornithology in Constance, Germany. Just, you know, pointing out, gave up a professor position at Princeton to go to Max Planck, okay? <laughs> yeah, okay, let's hear some applause, there. okay. Sorry for those of you from Princeton, okay, I apologize. Um, so um, he is also chair of biodiversity and collective behavior at the Department of Biology at the University of Constance. Um, and most recently, uh, he has become the head of the Center for Visual Computing of Collectives, um, significant resources to create a world leading facility for collaboration of computer scientists and behavioral biologists to address some of society's biggest challenges from insect plagues to disease spread to robotic intelligence. Uh, as you can imagine, he's received numerous awards for his research. Among them, the Zoological Society of London Scientific Medal. He's the recipient of Popular Science Magazine's Brilliant 10 Award uh, and National Geographic's Emerging Emerging Explorer Award. So um, Ian has come, I was gonna say he's come all the way from Germany, but actually he was a meeting on the West Coast uh, and has come here prior to going back to Germany. And we really thank him for taking time out of his busy schedule to be with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Ian Cousin. Hello everybody, it's wonderful to be here at this celebration of science and music, particularly because two of my brothers are professional musicians and there's always been a close interplay between science and music in our family. Um, I wasn't so musical, I was more involved in art and painting and drawing. When you see footage like this of schooling fish on a coral reef or flocking birds, you may have thought to yourself, well, how and why do animals coordinate their behavior like this? Well, this is really something we still know very little about. 
And yet collective behavior is not only all around us. We ourselves are a collective, and understanding collective behavior offers great insights, for example, in the treatment of cancer. Here you can see leader cells pushing a swarm of cancer cells into the body. And so in our department, we study collective behavior across scales to try to understand the fundamental principles from how it emerges and works among cells to how it emerges and works within our own complex human societies, as you see here. And so I'm going to start with a dramatic and very important example of collective behavior, and that's insect mass migration. Many of you will have seen footage like this on television, and some of you will know that these are locusts, the desert locusts to be specific. And this is like a wildfire that's gone out of control, these large flying swarms. This insect, in actual fact, emerges and hatches, this is fast forward footage from my lab in Oxford before I moved to Princeton, of these locusts hatching and emerging, and shortly you'll see them adopting collective behavior at the very start of their lives. And these are flightless insects until the dispersal phase as adults. And so we can see that there are dramatic examples of collective behavior that really impact people. This locust species can invade up to one-fifth of the Earth's land surface during plague years. The range, I do my field research in Mauritania, as you'll see shortly, the range that this locust can expand is extraordinary. But it's impacting poor people, subsistence farmers, and so there's no money from the, the chemical industry to deal with this problem. Astonishingly, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations estimates this one species of locust to impact the livelihood of one in 10 people on the planet through food shortage. And it contributes to major humanitarian crises, especially in Africa. It was admitted in the famous uh, scientific magazine that Fighting locusts, even after 50 years, fighting locusts is more of an art than a science. This is incredibly embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, we should do better, and yet we didn't know how and why these locusts formed swarms. So I wanted to address this question. Why do we see this collective behavior in these types of insects? And what are the processes that underlie it, and can we then mitigate these problems? And so we made advances by taking the locusts into the laboratory, breeding them, and they are not the smartest animals out there. We could put them in this sort of racetrack or particle accelerator for locusts, and they think they're moving in a never-ending desert environment. And I developed software that allows us to track the motion of all of the individuals simultaneously to see how they interact with each other. And what I got was a big surprise, because it turned out that aggressive interactions among these apparently vegetarian insects was driving the process of swarm formation. Repeatedly, in our experiments, we would see insects damaged. On the left-hand side, you can see the abdomen is damaged. And this, for a desert insect, is terrible. And the one on the right is completely doomed. So these insects are biting and gnawing and nibbling at each other. And so we did experiments whereby we located the nerve that gives the insects the sensation to the abdomen. And we could then cut that nerve so these insects can no longer feel that biting behavior. And in science, we also have to conduct what are called control experiments. And so we also had swarms of insects where we located the nerve, we tickled it, but then we sealed it up again. Now, the locusts are very robust and resilient, and this operation didn't impact their behavior in any way. They still moved the same and fed the same. However, when we put these two types of insects together into swarms, we found that the nerve-cut insects, here shown in red, over time, 
would become quiescent and not form these mobile swarms. We completely removed their capacity to form swarms. If they could feel the biting behavior, that's the swarms in black, they become active and form these marching mobile groups. And so I went out to Mauritania and there was, uh, there was a plague at the time. And so it took us about three days crossing the desert to find the swarm of insects. It was a really remarkable experience. And here is a locust on, the, on one of the, the tents that we'd set up, my colleagues had set up. And so here on the left, you can see me filming the locusts, trying to get data because we didn't know how these animals behave in the field. And on the right, you can see one of my Mauritanian colleagues and our camel. Um, and I got really attached to this. It was a very grumpy animal, to be honest, but I grew quite attached to this, and it's not often you do field research with a camel. But it turned out that, as I mentioned, there was a plague. And so despite having plenty of money with us, we eventually, after a month or so, ran out of food. That was all we could carry with us. And we tried to buy food from passing nomadic tribes people, and there was nothing to buy. No one cared about the money. There was a famine. And so the best we could do was to get camel entrails. This is the, the innards of a camel, um, which we dried in a small tree until it became like a jerky. And keen-eyed among you may see some flies laying their eggs in this beautiful, delicious dinner. Um, and I'd actually uh, been a vegetarian for 10 years prior to this trip. <laughs> and uh, I, I ate this, this jerky-like uh, substance. And actually, in fact, it didn't taste all that bad. In fact, it was not, not bad at all. But then I became horribly sick, horrifically sick. And there is no medical care in the middle of the Sahara, nor in Mauritania at all, for that matter. Um, so after a couple of weeks of thinking I was probably going to die, but then finally recovering, uh, this happened. You can see how well prepared I was. That was my $50 tent at the front there <laughs> that my Mauritanian colleagues laughed at me when I put it up. Their, their tent was behind. And that tree, that's the same tree we used to make the jerky. We're also drying our clothes in it. We're resourceful biologists. But what I want you to note is what's behind this scene. What is behind is a wall of sand moving towards our campsite. And to give you a sense of scale, this, I'm going to show you the exact same sandstorm that this is taken from one of NASA's satellites on the west coast of Africa. Enormous. This literally blew the locusts away. I was there for almost two months. I got about 20 minutes worth of data. And I keep that little video in my office to remind me of this experience. And so we came to the United States of America, where they have convenient things like roads. And we studied a comparable system, which are called Mormon crickets. We studied these in Utah and Idaho. And you see them crossing the roads here. In fact, they'll form slicks on the roads. But note in the foreground an individual pulling along one a dead other individual. And so again, if we look at these so-called vegetarian insects, we would see them frequently eating roadkill. They're eating the ears off this rabbit. They're crawling in through the eyes and in through the mouth. Biologically fascinating, absolutely disgusting. <laughs> uh, and we see them frequently also eating each other. And they'll take the dead individual and climb up something to get out of the swarm. And so we did a series of experiments where we could create artificial diets, so diets that we create in the laboratory that have the same nutritional composition as real diets. And so P here stands for protein, C stands for carbohydrate, and you'd expect these insects to go for carbohydrate, and the O is our control. It's a neutral diet that's got no nutritional value whatsoever, it's sort of like the McDonald's of the insect world. <laughs> and you can see here that they didn't care for carbohydrates. But when you have diets that increase in protein concentration, and further still, they have a strong preference. They taste it with their feet, and you'll see them fighting over the protein diets. Similarly, I conducted an experiment to look at the role of salt. So we go from zero molar salt concentration, i.e. water, 
all the way up to two molar salt concentration, very concentrated salt. And on the left, you sort of see a living histogram of water to the left and high concentration to the right, just for talk process, uh, purposes, I randomized it. But you see them fighting over 0.25 molar? This is the one that they loved. Well, why did they love this one so much? Well, it turned out to be exactly the concentration of their blood. And so these insects are very short of essential nutrients, specifically protein and salt. And what is a better packaged source of nutrients for you than another conspecific, another cricket? And so when they run out of these resources, they turn on each other. And so we have a new mechanism, what originally was thought to be a cooperative behavior among vegetarian insects, turns out in fact to be a forced march. Individuals attack those ahead and try to prevent themselves from being attacked from behind. Stop and you risk being eaten. And so we have a new mechanism to understand this process. Now, elsewhere in the natural world, thankfully, collective processes are not always driven by cannibalism. And you can see here why in the 1950s and 1960s, it was believed there must be telepathy among individuals or thought transference to explain these highly coordinated behaviors. And so what I've become fascinated by is we know a lot, and you've got one of the leading world institutes here studying how the brain works. But we also need to understand how social interactions bring brains together. Is there such a thing as a collective mind? And you can see the tight integration of behavior within these groups. And so to understand these processes, we have to develop state-of-the-art imaging tools and also computer models such as you see here to try to get inside the head of the individual to see how and why it behaves the way it does. And so this is what I did. I developed these models that allow me to simulate virtual individuals interacting with each other within the computer. And this allowed us to reveal that it's local interactions among these individuals that can explain these properties. We don't need to have complex telepathy within these groups. And so many of these beautiful patterns we see in nature, we can now begin to understand. And so when we look at these little animals, we can really get new insights. And so in the laboratory, to complement the modeling, we also study the social dynamics of these creatures. So these are a small golden shiner fish that actually bred in the billions for the live bait industry here in the US. So wonderful to have a thousand of these delivered to your lab for $70. A lot easier than going out to, to catch them. And so studying the humble golden shiner, we developed software that could track the motion of all of the individuals simultaneously so we can keep track of them all. And what we've discovered, and as you can see from those videos, is they have a fast, dynamic, and adaptable response. There's no need for a leader. There's no one telling them where to go or telling them what to do. This is so-called self-organized process. It's very robust. We can remove some of these individuals, and the system still behaves appropriately. And as I'll show you shortly, it also gives rise to collective intelligence. And so we wanted to set our animals a computational challenge. And so what we're doing here is we're projecting onto the base of the tank, that's the one at the top, onto the base of the tank, we're projecting a light gradient, representing the sort of dappled light that you may see in a stream. And the fish want to be in the dark regions because that's where they feel safe from predators. But because they're cryptic in the dark regions, we can't see them to track them. And so below that, you're seeing exactly the same experiment, but we're filming that in infrared light and cutting out the visible light. So it's exactly the same experiment. So you see the experiment at the top, so we have this dynamic light gradient and the fish are moving in this environment. We then use computer software to track their motion and then to ask, how do you respond to this environment? 
And indeed, we find the first experimental evidence that as group size increases, so we have groups of just one, a single individual, or we're up to groups of 256 individuals, as group size increases, the individuals become much better able to find the best solution, the darkest regions. But amazingly, it, the individuals themselves, we found, cannot detect the light gradient. And this, this leads to a, a real fascinating issue here. The individuals themselves can't detect the light gradient, but clearly the group can. I find that absolutely amazing. And so how are they able to do so? Well, it turns out that in contrast to what you may have heard in terms of the wisdom of crowds, usually when people talk about the wisdom of crowds, each individual makes an estimate regarding the problem, and then you pool those estimates. Well, here the individuals are not making an estimate. So it's given us a new insight into how intelligence can emerge among simple components. And it turns out what's important is the network of communication among these individuals. In our case, it's visual communication. So we've developed software that allow us to reconstruct how the animals see the world through which they're moving. We can reconstruct the pathways of light onto the retina hundreds of times per second to understand. And we could reveal for the very first time the network of communication within these animal groups. And it's this network, much like in the brain, this network of connectivity gives rise to our intelligence. Similarly, in the natural world, it's this network of social interactions that we find gives the groups collective intelligence and allows them, as a group, to track and respond to the environment. And this has great conservation implications because if you harvest these animals and they're not able to form these groups, well, then they lose this capability. They can no longer migrate or respond appropriately to their environment. It's also given new insights into how we can develop new robots, including Shiner bots inspired by our Shiner fish, because this algorithm needs just very simple components interacting with each other. And in the future, the idea is to make these nano-sized bots that can even go into the body for medical treatments, to track gradients of chemicals produced by tumors, for example. And so we see remarkable properties within these groups. We see leadership and decision-making. Now, before I said they don't need to have a leader, that's absolutely true. But similarly, there can be some individuals within the group that have information, for example, about where to go during a migration or when there's food. Do they need to signal to others, I know what's going on, follow me? And do others need to recognize who has information and who does not? Well, using our computational models and experiments, we've been able to show that information flows through the system without requiring this complexity, no signaling, no individual recognition. Now, one informed individual is trying to guide the group towards me. You can see it's not able to do so. It's a group of 100 here. But if we look, for example, at five informed individuals within a group, even though there's no signaling or communication, explicit communication, you can see they're sort of moving in the right direction. But if we reach a critical number of informed individuals within the group, you can see very accurately they will move in this preferred direction. So this gives us a new insight, and we've tested this idea. This is now not a simulation, as you saw before. This is a real school of fish showing the wave of information percolating across the system. But just like in human societies, within animal groups, there can be conflicts about where to go. So I've shown you that information can be processed by the group, but what about if some individuals want to go one way, shown in red, and others want to go another way, shown in green? Can the group come to a collective consensus decision? Without signaling, without individual recognition, without the ability to, to count, well, amazingly, there's an equal number that want to get to the white and the red target, the rest are uninformed, and it's going to be random which one they choose, they're going to choose the red. 
But if I add just one extra individual to the group, so 1% of total group size, for the white target in this instance, you can see that collectively, through the fluid-like nature of the group, they will collectively compute, even though no individual can count, over 98% of the time, they will make the right estimate and go to the majority. So when you look at a bird flock or a fish school next time, what you're effectively looking at is a fluid organic computer that is able to compute things about its environment that no individual is even aware of. And however, if they're really unwilling to give up on their preferences, then of course groups can split and can learn new things about their environments. And this has given us great insights into how organisms like our schooling fish make decisions such as between the blue and the yellow target. But perhaps surprisingly, we've also shown that this understanding extends to complex creatures like these baboons, wild baboons in Africa. So we caught almost all adults in a troop and put GPS collars on the individuals, allowing us to estimate their motion every second. So every second we get their position. So this is a wild group in Kenya. And what we find is that the baboons like the fish, they like to stay together for the benefits of group living. But you can see here, some individuals want to go one way around this object, and others want to go another way. And yet, they will always come to consensus and favor the majority. So these groups, without counting, without explicit voting, are very fast and very capable as collective decision-making entities. In fact, perhaps us humans can learn something from these natural examples. And so really, it's allowed us to show that there are similar mathematical principles extending across what appear to be very divergent systems. But these baboons are also embedded in a complex physical and structured environment. So recently, we went back out to Kenya. That's me in the middle with one of my PhD students and a group leader in my department. And we used this drone. This is amazing, this new technology that we have. This drone automatically images the three-dimensional structure of the habitat through which these animals live. So this now allows us to understand the complexity of the space through which they move. And we can now include the animal's movements, these beautiful detailed movements of the creatures recorded by GPS, by satellite data, to the structured environment. And this has given us a much better understanding of how animals interact with their world which is critical if we're going to understand, for example, human impacts on the planet. And so later this year, Russian astronauts are taking a new device developed by my colleague Martin Wakelsky at the Max Planck Institute for Ornithology onto the International Space Station that will allow us to use a new generation of much smaller, much lighter, much uh, more sophisticated tags that can be put onto smaller animals. And so we're going to use the animals as sensors of our planet, of the health of our planet. And so I hope to have shown you today that we can learn a lot about observing the natural world around us, from swarming crickets that turn out to be cannibals, to schooling fish that turn out to be individually not so smart, but collectively very intelligent. And of course, this does give us some insights into subconscious behaviors and perhaps even some conscious behaviors in our own human society. So I'd like to thank you all very much for coming today to listen to me, and I should really thank my sponsors for funding this research.
Before I play two pieces by the great French composer Camille Saint-Saëns, I would like to make an announcement. I'm very thankful to all organizers and participants of uh, this event and to Barbara Noble and uh, Becky and Jimmy Mayer for making this event possible. And And uh, right after this event, um, if you would like, you could purchase uh, one of my recently released uh, CDs entitled Love Game. And also, you could leave your email address so that I could add you to my invitation list. And now, Camille Saint-Saëns, uh, the first piece is uh, the most famous piece by Saint-Saëns entitled this one, and after that, uh, one of the greatest masterpieces by Saint-Saëns, his second piano concerto. Originally, this concerto was written for piano and orchestra. However, another famous French composer, Georges Bizet, made an adaptation for the, of this concerto for the solo piano. Yes, that same great Georges Bizet that wrote the immortal opera Carmen. So he made a transcription of this concerto, the entire concerto, piano and orchestra parts are contained in this solo piano version.
Thank you very much. I love you. My God. Um, absolutely, absolutely fantastic. There actually aren't words for that. That was, that was amazing. Um, that does conclude um, our, uh, our event for this evening. Um, let's, uh, let's thank uh, Sophia and Ian for wonderful performances. And I thank all of you for coming and supporting the Institute. Uh, just a reminder, we have one more Science Meets Music uh, this season. It's Wednesday, April 19th. And if you can come and uh, see our program, you're going to learn something really, really interesting about hearing from one of the research group leaders, a very successful research group leader, right here at Max Planck Florida Institute. Thank you again for coming, safe trip home, and hope to see you then. Thank you.